Hi, so I'm Ben Bello, the Digital Vice Growth Strategy Manager here at WorldPay based in London. I'm really excited to be talking to Neil Zepro about the transformation of payments in the video game space. Neil, introduce yourself. Hey, thank you, Ben. You know, super excited to be here. So, hey, folks, my name is Neil Sapre, and I'm an international growth consultant at Google. What I do uh, pre- primarily is uh, help some of our top customers grow and expand in international markets. Uh, and I'm based in San Francisco. Prior to this, I've been working in many apps and gaming companies, and I'm really excited to share about my experience today. I wanted to talk to you about how you got into video games freshly and uh, personally, because I know from my experience, I started off at PC, playing games like RuneScape and then moving on to mobile. The smartphones came out more and then on to console, uh, playing, playing. So I've enjoyed it. I've seen it change over time. But how did you get into it? I mean, on a professional front, actually, I worked at a gaming studio almost 10 years ago. I started off as a community manager as an intern and then grew up to be a QA manager and eventually into game production. Uh, I still remember it was an FPS browser-based game and we used to work on the Unity 3D engine. So exciting times. On a personal front, you know, I'm also a a big gamer myself. And a lot of my time currently, Ben, is spent on playing FIFA. That's my go-to sort of game, uh, you know, on the weekends usually. Uh, I also love taking a coffee break at work while playing Coin Master. And last but not the least, my favorite game of all time is Age of Empires, which I watch online on Twitch. The other thing is, I think we need to have a game of uh, FIFA or now it's eSports FC 25. You know, I'd love to challenge. I know, Ben, you're a big Arsenal fan. You know, it'll be interesting to see how this goes and to challenge you for a couple of games. Uh, and, you know, you, there's, there's also like a, a, a lot has changed on the payments front, right? And you mentioned payments a couple of times before as well. So I, I want to know, you know, can you give us more details on, on, on or what's your view on this? Yeah, for sure. And I'll definitely be uh, playing with Arsenal when we play it. So payment evolution has happened in the video game space quite drastically. If we look at the last 40, 50 years, originally you'd have to play on an arcade, you'd leave your home, you'd use a coin or a token and you'd play that way. Then we saw the transition into going into stores and buying a disc and putting it into a console, for example. But then we're seeing the evolution past that. Now we're seeing People pay with obviously their card number, like card details. But what's coming even further, what's really important, is digital wallets, for example. That's how people are playing, paying for things outside of the video game space and actually how they're paying within it now. So it's all about speed and convenience for people within payments for me, I think. We're seeing evolution from a point of view of growth in the industry, so people are playing video games at a younger age and at an older age now. We're seeing the amount of people grow in the, in the video game space. So it's going to reach around 3.5 billion in 2025. Why is that so important? That's half the world's population. So it's a growing and exciting industry. And then we have to think about how people play exactly. I know back in the day when I was playing offline, there was no social interaction apart from the person you were with. But now that's ballooned up. We're seeing a lot of cross-platform play. So me playing against you, PC versus mobile, or PC versus console, for example. So it's it's super exciting. It's super interesting. I remember reading somewhere that the gaming industry is actually the largest entertainment industry in the world. It's, it's even larger than the music and the movie industry. So that's a testament to us, you know, not only the, the revenue size, but population reach uh, that, that that gaming has, which is awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, going going back in time, uh, a couple of uh, incidents I remember. The first time I came across payments in gaming is, of course, when I played RuneScape as well, as well as a game called Second Life, right? Where you could exchange uh, US dollar into virtual currency. And now we see everything on Metaverse. And, and we've seen forms of, you know, similar forms uh, back in the day as well. So uh, what is interesting is now this is way more common now, right? With, with, with like I mentioned, metaverse and 5G high-speed internet, it's much, much easier. Um, I also remember how game game distribution, how how tough it was. You know, I remember Doom being released on a shareware model, and and then now we've come such a long way from that. So, but my my specific experience from APAC, where payments is like very diverse, right? Uh, in APAC, in Asia, you could just go down to a 7-Eleven, a convenience store, and buy a prepaid sort of like a gift card that you can, you know, put the code into 
uh, the game and play the game. That that's an amazing method because Asia is primarily a cash driven economy, right? So that's there. Uh, we also have another unique system in Asia called carrier billing, where you know uh, you pass on the bills of the game onto your mobile phone carrier, and then at the end of the month is when you see uh, you know your, your your phone provider is billing you for your gaming time, etc. And that's very interesting because as a developer, you sort of have to anticipate that at the end of the month, you're going to see a huge spike in, in your revenue, right? And accordingly, you need to plan your seasonal activities. You need to plan also how your ROI is going to be calculated. And, you know, this, this just throws up a lot of interesting points, I, I would say. Um, the other thing what game payment also does, Ben, is it elongates a life cycle of the game. I think that's super important as well, right? I've seen uh, a lot of AAA light, light, uh, titles that used to be launched. You remember when back in the day, let's 15 years ago, they were launched and in two weeks, whatever people had to buy it, would buy it and then move on to the next title. But now because of uh, microtransactions, because of DLCs, etc., we see that the life cycle of a game is much longer. Take GTA 5, for example, right? It was launched on PlayStation 3 and now we are in PS5. It's spanned across three eras of uh, console gaming and then the reason essentially is because of gta online the the microtransaction it enables a developer to sort of like you know support a game longer and then you know i'm a big fan because it just provides a uh, richer content um similarly also in mobile gaming we see that there's a freemium model where you know uh, games that were like four five years old candy crush saga being a classic example are still quite a thing i would say I think it's it's really interesting. Do you have any other points uh, to add to this, Ben? Yeah, for sure. That microtransaction or small transactions, DLCs, that really resonated with me, especially with the example that you used, which is part nostalgia looking back to my childhood, but part now, right? I think what's so important is that now, yeah, you've got games that can live for longer and actually monetize for longer. So where you've got transactions that are to benefit from a cosmetic point of view, we see skins all the time. We see from a functional point of view, access to new weapons, upgrades, levels. And we see from a consumable point of view, so whether that's like a health potion to make you, you you're a bit more longer lasting in the game. I think that's amazing. But then I look into the psychology of the gamer as well, and I think it's great for the end customer when they're playing from a point of view where they can have instant gratification, they can buy what they want that's going to help them advance in the game, which is fantastic. And then we see it from the merchant's point of view where they can actually get feedback from the, the player. If they're buying, you know, a certain amount of content and um, whether it's a certain upgrade, you know that's working well, repeat it or do something similar. So I love that. That's something that I'm seeing happen. And I think it's really important what happens with that is you're in a lobby, you can quickly purchase your weapon upgrade, for example. So... Payments should really happen seamlessly and in background if they're working really, really well. So that's something I'm seeing. On the market expansion front, I loved your experience talking about APAC. And I think it's so important when we talk about different markets that you can't copy and paste from one market to the next. You have to kind of tailor what you do to make sure it resonates. We do that with you know content by developers and publishers. They think about what they're going to release before the game and actually get customer experience and uh, feedback on that and they should do it during and post as well especially if games are lasting longer and there's microtransactions in there what i would say for that is if you're working with a payments company which is obviously how you drive a lot of revenue by your own customers it's really important to know the market and they'll know the market if they're big enough they'll know what it's like and if they know the industry as well they'll be able to connect the two so what they can do is help you expand into new industry new markets should i should say and actually expand in the existing markets that you're at so i think the global market expansion element is really important and actually what you said around in-app payments which is super super interesting Ben, those were some great points, you know, uh, very interesting. And, you know, this is a topic I hold uh, dear to my heart. Uh, this is something I do a lot. And, you know, historically in my career, I've actually worked with a lot of uh, um, gaming publishers as well as uh, all, all sorts of businesses in trying to help them expand to global markets and make their game culturally relevant in several markets, right? I had a few points, like, again, going back in time, you know, I think when this this session, we, we're, we're talking a lot about, you know, what it was versus what it is. So we, we'll continue with this theme, right? 
And and just going back in time, if you historically thought of how games were distributed, even going back 20 years, I remember we had to queue up when a game was launched at midnight, right? Right. I'm sure you remember those days. And then you have to wait for fit to physically buy the copy. You go back home, install the game, and 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 sort of finally you're able to play it, right? And sometimes the, the game ran out of stock, etc. There were issues. Um, and, and and sometimes we lived in a place, you know, or a city where, where it wasn't quite convenient to get it. And now all of this has been superseded by, you know, easy and seamless distribution by global platforms, right? You have the PlayStation Store, you have Steam, you also have Apple Store, etc. And then it's just so easy to, as a consumer, to just install or download the game wherever you are uh, in an instant as soon as it's like uh, launched. And, and as a distributor, as a game uh, publisher, think about it, how easy it is for you to sort of like launch globally you don't have to physically print these cds and and then sort of like you know have a cover and then for heaven forbid imagine if you, if you launch a game that has like a bug in it or some sort of issues and you physically ship the disc it's such a problem to to sort of update the game but now because everything's digital you just release a hot fix and then you know uh, all is good so that's from a distribution point of view uh what is also really good for a game publisher, I feel it's also the market size. As you mentioned, Ben, previously, 3.5 billion. That's been possible primarily because it's so easy to distribute the games, right? Uh, you can uh, launch in uh, any country that you want, in any city, and then that's that's been uh, a key driver. And as a developer, right, what it does is it gives you a way larger audience pool. And at the end of the day, you know, I, I see game developers as artists, right? The more people that have access to the work, the more people that can appreciate their work as an artist, a game developer, you know, that's their ultimate dream to sort of have as many people play uh, their game as possible. And that's what these distribution platforms sort of enable them to do. Also, another interesting thing why it's important to um, you know expand globally is to monetize. And when I mean by monetize, that you can monetize it in different ways. So, for example, let's let's take a mobile game, right? If we look at the U.S., a lot of uh, mobile games um, earn revenue from Western markets through IAPs, through subscriptions, etc. Then you move on to uh, developing markets, emerging markets, uh, specifically those such as India, where you, you have a huge user base, but the payments landscape is not as evolved. And hence, you can go for an ad monetized strategy. And I feel this this sort of like global expansion for developers allows them to address all these different markets and sort of like have different strategies for different markets, right? So it, it indeed is a global business now. I'm going to pass it back to you to start talking about um, also monetization strategies if you had in your mind uh, or any sort of like global points of view. Yeah, no, I do. I love that. And to be honest, what I love most about it is how digital it is. There's not necessarily a need for brick and mortar and to physically sell the goods. It can be distributed online, which means, you know what, access for everyone especially as more and more places come online and their populations grow with access to coming online monetization strategies i thought was really interesting as well we've seen their app stores from yeah my time as a kid when a you know the playstation store started to come more and more online and more and more advanced and i'm actually seeing direct to consumer as well so some publishers are saying look we can monetize via the, those stores but we can also monetize directly to the consumer ourselves trying to i think capture the multi-platform gamer so where people are playing across pc mobile and console what they're looking to do is have a sort of a uniform approach so do you have a login that you can use and play across all of those platforms so you can play when you're on your way back from work or from school and then actually jump off the mobile and then go onto the console or pc when you're at home so I think direct to consumer is a really interesting trend and actually really interesting to watch this space. What I would say for that is, of course, you want consistency of experience with the content. So from mobile to PC to console, for example, but you also want the consistency in the payment experience. You want it to feel the same way, look like your brand, have the same font, the same colors, exactly that. So that it feels more familiar which we were talking about with market expansion, familiarity is so, so important. So direct to consumer for me is is super interesting. And I think 
a way payment providers can support a merchant with how they reach more customers because at the end of the day that's what we're trying to do right together is grow the industry which is is growing and is a lot is a really important and interesting industry within entertainment so that was kind of my view um on, on that another point if i could add you know before passing it back to you uh also when it talks about like when we talk about ip payment and all and 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 what it does to a game right we we see a lot of controversy around uh, ips influencing you know gamers to sort of like ledge the game in their direction but i also see there are some amazing examples of how microtransactions and ips have been implemented specifically i think we mentioned you know we were having a chat before uh, about cs go as well um, yeah as fortnite where you can buy cosmetic items and these cosmetic items actually you know cost a lot of in game like real life currency but it's really cool in the sense it does not imbalance the game in any direction it's just purely cosmetic in nature uh i think that's that's also a very very interesting uh point that i just wanted to you know bring across be- before i give it back to you and i think when we look at that what you know we've got publishers we've got uh, distributors and of course the developers but we can't forget around the streaming side and the rest of it so that is heavily attractive to the streaming side of people consuming games and not just by physically playing them but also by watching them we saw the last of us do really well uh, in terms of winning awards and this is something that the industry is quite new to the industry if i'm honest before we saw people with user generated content and playing themselves but now we're seeing this turn into a blockbuster tv series so yeah the industry is going in different directions and there's different ways to, to monetize it which is really important so uh, yeah i think to summarize going direct to consumer has a lot more control which is great and doesn't mean you have to stop selling games on other platforms but what i want to talk about is actually time to live to games what do you think is going to drive that to come quicker because ultimately that's how you monetize make revenue and then you can produce more games for the industry what do you think is going to get us there quicker well i think one big trend that we are seeing in the industry is uh, generative ai right that's been that's been rock of this year i would say uh and you know it's it's it's, it's a big thing in the industry uh so but but specifically you know i i remember reading an article in a famous publication and what one thing they talked about is what generative ai is going to help us do is uh help us develop games quicker right uh, a lot of the work being done by ai would be uh, in in creating a lot of content within the game itself and and this sort of like reduces the development life cycle of of a title um what i i i also feel is uh you know again you know from my point of view i always think about how can a game be more international how can a game be exported to more markets so i'm looking for ai to, to ai based solutions in gaming that will help localize the game to multiple markets and you know this will just make the job easier for a developer to sort of expand to multiple market markets so that's what you know gets me more exciting but the, the most important thing ben that i want to call out is uh you know i see ai uh rather than replacing what humans do is enhancing what we do right i want the levels to be more deeper the music to be more richer and i think ai is going to help us enhance a lot of the things that we already do so in the next few years we are going to see i feel some amazing amazing uh, games come out uh you know with, with a combination of, of of our intellect as well as ai Uh what about you Ben what excites you the most Do you know what? I love that you said in hard drop and replace it resonates with me in terms of other industries when we look at for example autopilot it didn't replace pilots it just made their jobs easier and that's how I think generative AI should help this industry when we look at it from a video game perspective as long as the data and the IP is in line and there's no conflict there I think it's fantastic the more games in the industry the more people can play it and the more access people have that can only be a good thing when i look at that as well I, it resonates with me around leaning on the ecosystem so it's leaning on game engines and generative ai to actually do a lot of the hard work a lot of the building blocks so then the developers and the publishers can almost put the icing on the cake but of course the concept still comes from them and they know what sells and they know their content is king So I've been asked really important and it resonates with me across the whole ecosystem when I think about 
the the game, I think what surrounds that and what helps make revenue is that app, uh, app the advertising, I should say, helps it make revenue. The game engine, as we've just talked about, also from a payments point of view, which enables the end customer to access the game and also stops them from getting ejected from the game. It, it's really important that lean on the ecosystem, lean on the specialists in the industry to actually allow your content to to grow and actually reach more people, which is, of course, the objective here. So that's kind of how I see generative AI playing into the ecosystem. Let's be wild here, Neil. Let's get our crystal ball out and see what we think will happen in 2030. It's a long way away, but what do you think could happen? Uh, I've got my view. Uh, What's yours? I think um, since we're talking about trends, right, uh, one of the trends that really excites me uh, going ahead in the future is pro gaming, right, professional gaming. Uh, as a kid, of course, it was my dream to make a living out of uh, gaming, you know, and, and and I'm fortunate enough to make a living from gaming, but, you know, not as playing games, uh, more of supporting their growth. But, you know, pro gaming has come a long way uh, in the last 15, 20 years. It's funny, Ben, um, just a few months back, we had the finals of League of Legends in the Chase Arena. Chase Arena is a big stadium in San Francisco and it was sold out completely. So you had 60,000 plus fans cheering for a gaming tournament and then that was an amazing sight, I would say, to have. Uh, another fun fact is uh, the Asian Games just happened, uh, you know, in this year. And Asian Games are similar to Olympics, but just for the continent of Asia. And cyber gaming was actually a sport. They had four medals up for four different types of games. And it's, you know, countries actually won medals and it was on the same level as, let's say, football or, or any other sport in there. So I thought those were like very interesting things. And going ahead, it's going to be interesting, as I think you also mentioned, um, Ben, about the relevance of uh, platforms, of streaming platforms, of streamers, how this has unlocked a different uh, genre of entertainment as well as a revenue source for, for everyone involved in the industry. And and I think pro gaming is, is like this third um, you know, avenue that has come across that also is going to help grow this industry as as well as, you know, uh, help connect everyone uh, together. Uh, so, yeah, that's something I'm really excited about. What about you, Ben? Yeah, I'm not going to copy you. I've got two things and hopefully they're not, they're not just buzzwords in my mind. They're two things that will actually be very prevalent in 2030. You can probably guess one of them is cloud gaming. So, you know, we saw the Microsoft Activision uh, deal happen and a lot of that was around cloud gaming. And I think that's going to be key. How do we actually allow people to play when they want and not wait for downloads or whatever? They can play when they want, where they want. I think in 2030, it's still a long way to go at the moment, but in 2030, that will happen a lot across a lot more markets. I'm looking at the US, for example, Germany, Japan, South Korea. Is some key hotspots as well. So that's my prediction number one. Prediction number two is around the metaverse. I know we've talked about this and looking at uh, nostalgia in Sims or PlayStation Home and, uh, and interacting with people that way in RuneScape as we talked about as well. I think when we look at Generation Alpha, so 0 to 12-year-old to a younger than Gen Z, they're consuming video games in a different way, not just playing, it's watching, it's interactive, it's social. I think that's going to be a lot more prevalent as that generation has more of an influence on the industry and as they come towards being balanced and able to make monetization decisions themselves. So I think that's going to happen. I think it's going to be really exciting though and a lot more immersive than it has been. So that's a my bold prediction for 2030. I want to just touch upon the, the, the Chase event. So when I was at GDC in San Francisco, I was lucky enough to go and see the, the Golden State Warriors at the Chase Center. And it was buzzing then. To, so to see a video game of men <laughs> have the same level of audience is really, really exciting. You know, we, we're used to seeing that level of audience in conferences like G-Star or Gamescom Asia or GDC. But to see... It being monetized in that way from tickets to payouts to the players, I think is is really exciting. So yeah, there's our bold predictions. Let's see if we get if they actually do come true. Neil, my friend, pleasure as always to talk to you about the industry, what you have seen in the past, 
now and actually what we expect in the future. I know you will be tracking and I'll be tracking what's happening in the industry to see if there's any influence or anywhere we can help grow it. So it's a pleasure uh, as always. Any parting thoughts? Absolutely, Ben. Thank you so much for having me. You know, talk talk with you on this amazing five side side chat. And yeah, there was it was it was like an amazing interaction, learning from you, also sharing my thoughts and opinion. And you know, looking forward to you know continuing this sharing in in future sessions. Thank you so much, Ben. Likewise, I think we'll get to that game of FIFA or EAFC as it's now called. Sounds good. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye.